The Wash It Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There will be spoilers. This episode is scripted by Newell Fisher, John Ruth and Liam McKayla and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 114 in which we'll be looking at the fifth story from part three of Tales from Watership Down, chapter 16 of the overall book, Heisenthay in Action. But first I need to make an important announcement. This podcast focuses, in case you haven't noticed, on one species of British wildlife, but the close cousins of wild rabbits are the domesticated breeds that are one of the most popular pets here in the UK, besides cats and dogs, as mentioned in episode 93. The Rabbit Welfare Association and Fund is a UK-based charity that focuses on promoting the welfare of domesticated rabbits in this country. As their own website says, quote, Despite being one of the most popular pets, rabbits are amongst the most neglected, with a vast proportion living out their days confined to a hutch, alone and unable to display the behaviours they would show in the wild. We aim to improve domestic rabbits' health and welfare through campaigning, education and the most up-to-date advice. At the Rabbit Welfare Association and Fund, we are determined to make life better for rabbits. Our message, a hutch is not enough, sums up that popping a lone rabbit in a small hutch at the bottom of the garden doesn't really make the grade for kind, thoughtful and healthy welfare. As it's so significant, a hutch is not enough is also the name of our campaign to change the world's view on keeping rabbits. End quote. I've decided not to wait until Christmas to launch a charity appeal to raise funds for the RWAF and have set up a just giving appeal in the name of this podcast as this allows them to collect gift aid, which adds at 25% to donations. This replaces the initial Facebook appeal. Thank you so much, Kirsty Yates, for your donation to that. Much appreciated. As I am launching this appeal at the time of year when the story of Watership Down opens, I've decided to call it the Primrose Appeal. There will be a link in the notes, or go to justgiving.org and look up the Rabbit Welfare Fund. The appeal is in my name, Newell Fisher. Please give generously and share this appeal with your friends. If you're not in the UK and would prefer to give closer to home, please do let me know about appropriate charities in your country, and I'll give these a mention. The charity have also asked me to mention a UK-based change.org petition that reads Amend legislation to ensure rabbit breeders require the same licensing as dog breeders. Well worth signing. Again, link in the notes. I've also had another email from Eric Steps to let me know that he has recorded gameplay from the German Watership Down video game from 2001. This includes scenes from Sandalford Warren, which weren't featured in the TV series it was based upon, so well worth a look, and he tells me there is more to come. There will be a link in the notes, and his YouTube channel is called Higurashi Otaku. I'm also sharing this footage on relevant Facebook groups. Thank you so much, Eric, for all your work you're doing on this. So then, back to Watership Down. Part 3, Story 5, Chapter 16 Heisenthay in action. The opening quotation is from one of W.S. Gilbert's Bab Ballads, Captain Rees. He is better known for his role in the Gilbert and Sullivan operas, but these ballads, published in the magazine Fun, often became the basis of songs and plots in those operas. The quotation features Captain Rees doing his duty as a good leader to keep his crew happy. Oddly enough, the wider context from the poem is that he promises that all unmarried members of his crew shall find a wife, and just as the captain says he will be the only bachelor on board, the boatswain points out that his widowed mother has long loved Captain Rees from afar, and so the captain finds a wife as well. Finding wives. What could be the relevance to all ship down? The chapter opens following on directly from the previous one. As it turns out, Hazel is not in the warren to receive the messenger from Ephrafa, as he is on one of his periodic scouting missions to Nathaya Farm, a place he counts as lucky for the rabbits of Watership Down since the defeat of General Woundwart the previous summer. This is compared appropriately, considering the opening quotation, to the proper respect a sailor has for the sea, something that could kill you, or be of great benefit if treated with appropriate respect. And so, the only chief available to receive the messenger is the newly made co-chief Heisenthay Ra, for whom the other chief, Hazel Ra, is her buck. I nearly wrote that she is his doe, but changed it deliberately, for the possession of a partner goes both ways, yet only usually seems to be expressed one way. The messenger, a buck named Rittler, 
informs Heisenstein in the honeycomb that a party of does is on their way from Ephrafa to see if they would like to settle on Warship Down, as Ephrafa is getting overcrowded again. This is ironic, considering the large number of rabbits who have just left Warship Down with Flyeth to found a new warren elsewhere. Riffler had been sent to Campion, chief rabbit of Ephrafa, with a message a few months earlier, and had settled there with the doe. Thus he knew the route back to Watership Down. The does have been left by Rithla at Caesar's Belt, not far south of Watership Down, to continue on their way while he presses ahead. Heisenthal, not long a chief and concerned to get things right, is concerned that the does are vulnerable in the open, and decides to go herself to bring them in, telling Rithla to rest and Silflay. Oddly enough, I think Rithla is the first buck in the world of Watership Down to be named in Laypine only. Bigwig, Fiverr and Pipkin are also referred to by their Lapine names, but always the English is used primarily. Was this a mistake by Adams, or a deliberate moving on of, con of a convention? Bigwig, the captain of Owlsley, is understandably concerned at Heisenthal's decision. She points out there is one path the Doze will be on, presumably the right of way that branches south from the Wayfarer's Walk just east of the Trig Station at Nuthanger Down, so it should be easy to pick up the Doze trail. At this point, Bigwig loses his temper with Heisenthal and uses some derogatory language that challenges her ability to be a leader. He says Hazelra would forbid her to do this if he were present. This is Heisenthal's first real test, and she goes up to the far larger Bigwig and tells him directly not to challenge her authority and to have clean burrows ready for their guests when she gets back. She then sets off south, leaving Bigwig fuming. It is now early evening. Heisenthal does not find the does as quickly as she expected, and approaching Caesar's belt gets a tip-off from a female hare that they are sheltering by a beech tree. She asks them why they have stopped, and is informed that one of the does, named Nairim, has hurt one of her hind legs and cannot go any further. Heisenthal tells them that Nairim shows no sign of injury and only needs rest. She will stay with Nairim, and the rest of them should get moving towards Warship Down. The rest of the does get moving, and Heisenthal settles down with Nareem for one of the most frightening nights of her life. She dare not fall asleep in case of a lil. Her thought processes, as she contemplates the vulnerability of rabbits, are very well described by Adams. She muses that rabbits seem to be the only creatures in nature that don't hunt and kill, and that Woundwart's efforts to change this came to nothing in the end. Of course, Heisenthal is wrong about rabbits being the only creatures this applies to, but in her situation it is understandable. Indeed, she even finds herself wishing Woundwort were next to her right now, such is her fear. The moon had ridden, risen earlier, and now she notices it is setting. She must have slept. And then she becomes aware they are being watched. It is a rat. Heisenthal places herself between the rat and Nairim, who wakes up, afraid as she threatens the rat to leave them alone, using hedge vernacular. And then, without warning, in a shocking moment of blood-smelling feathers, the rat is gone, caught in the talons of an owl. They sleep again, exhausted, and when they awake it is just after sunrise. Nairim is able to move a short distance. She hurt her leg following a doe she admired as she jumped down a steep bank. Heisenthal decides they will rest for the rest of, for the, rest of the day, and then hopefully Nairim's leg will be rested enough. There is more description of nature as Heisenthal waits quietly through the day with Nairim, watching the insects in the grass and the clouds in the sky. The two does are so still that birds land next to them. Then, late that afternoon, Heisenthal is alarmed to hear a large creature nearby. It is Bigwig. He awkwardly makes out that he was just out and about by chance, but we can tell the truth. Nairim says she thinks she can make it the rest of the way now, and Bigwig offers to be on one side of her as she makes her way. He says Heisenthal should be on the other side. Only after a slight cough, he calls her Heisenthal Ra for the first time. And now we switch to Nairim's point of view, as she realises that, that this must be the famous Flaley who defeated General Woundwort in combat, and that these are rabbits who think nothing of helping one another. She resolves to do whatever she can to stay on Watership Down. They arrive at the Down just before nightfall to find Hazel and Silver pretending to Silflay, but actually watching out for them. And Nairim, at last, joins her companions on Watership Down. Is it canon? So let's round off the part of this book in which Richard Adams attempts to redress the underrepresentation of female characters in the 1972 novel. 
John Ruth writes, quote, It's an interesting part of Tales where Hazel ends up being a co-chief rabbit with Heisenthal. It's interesting and odd as well. Hazel and Heisenthal are together, just like Fiverr and Vilthyril are. A pair of leader types and a pair of seer types. As I've stated before, I think Richard Adams reacted to the criticism he received for the roles of females in Watership Down. If so, he found an interesting way of doing so. He both expanded the roles of female rabbits for Watership Down and brought in new characters that gave us readers the connection to the secret river. I like to reflect back on that last poignant chapter of Watership Down. At that point, it is clear that Hazel is the chief rabbit. Adams refers to Hazel's burrow in a singular way and not like it was a shared place. There is even a kind of throwback to the Thraera when Hazel realises that the sentry should have first asked Hazel if it was okay to send in a visitor. Even that way that Hazel asks, do you want to talk to me, is a bit Thraera in a, a way, but Hazel as chief is not as Churchillian, both good and bad, as the Thraera was. By all of this, might we assume that Heisenthal had already passed on? Given that Adams identified that Hazel had lived longer than three years, say four or maybe even five, I think we can assume that Heisenthal had already passed on, and that Hazel never again sought another companion. He doesn't. He really doesn't give us all the answers, though, does he? Back in 1972, he did, just did not yet know that Hazel and Heisenthal would become a couple. Maybe he knew, but I think not. I'd guess he determined this later on. Also, he needed to not to give us all the answers. In any kind of fiction, and even in real history studies, some speculation is a good thing. It leaves room to discuss things in, well, in podcasts, for instance. Another sad assumption we might make is that Hazel was most likely the last of all the Sandalford rabbits to depart. When it came to Adam's maybe lack of inclusion for female, females and watership down, he was a product of his time. As a World War II veteran, I'd say this was very much the case. Women served in the war and in some dangerous capacities, but not often in the same way as men. There were no female soldiers in the artillery, infantry, no female fighter pilots or bomber crew, etc. The same here in the US. Normally, I'm not a fan of saying that some, someone was of their time, because it's sometimes used to excuse former bad practices. Folks here in the US used to just use that to justify folks who use slaves or involved in some other bad practice. In this case, though, I think it's OK to say that. It's also interesting to me that Adams was inspired to tell these stories by his daughters. I'd surmise that, to a human female warship down reader, maybe the worst that Adams did was when we learned about the death of the unnamed Ephraf and Doe that died in the jaws of a homba. The group of females, even though we know a couple by name, are treated more like a commodity in a way that I think would not be lost on a female reader. Some things can be made up for and some not, but I'd say he did his best. End quote. Leah Michaela adds, quote, one potential frame for interpretation is once again reading the story as a mirror of some themes from the original novel. I read first Nairim as a mirror of Nelfilta, young Afraf and Doe, who's joining older rabbits to get away from there, but maybe more to get a sense of belonging and being part of something important and together with the cool bunnies than for the sake of getting elsewhere. Only that Nairim succeeds where Nelfilta fails. In a way, Heisenthal could be so protective of Nairim because there is history of her failing with another young Doe. Then, on the other hand, young, impressionable and trustful Naim could also be a mirror image of Pipkin, if Heisenthal is mirroring Hazel. And the owl is Heisenthal's Dea Ex Machina, something potentially dangerous turned into a saviour. I reread the chapter a couple of times before st I stopped to chuckle that Heisenthal sends Bigwig cleaning and Thethuthanang to deliver an important, important message after Bigwig has been questioning her authority. In the frame of the story, it seems Bigwig is faster to call Heisenthal Ra than Hazel. Setting the story to larger chron chronological continuum, that might not be the case, though. Bigwig was a character I liked in Warship Down, and in Tales he keeps being so annoying, I've been thinking, I'll oh, send him to Wide Patrol already, every few pages. It might be, though, sending him to clean a few burrows has a similar effect. End quote. As for the canon status of this chapter... If we grant that Heisenthal becoming joint lead chief with Hazel was a positive move, her proving her worth early on rings true. And the account of Heisenthal's time in the open, to me, is comparable in tone to the original novel and the major plus point of this chapter. Opposition to Heisenthal's actions from Bigwig, who is often portrayed by narrators and actors as quite military in tone, and therefore possibly the closest in mindset to that which Richard Adams encountered in the army in World War II, also rings true. However, his aggressive rudeness towards Heisenthal, with whom he worked so closely to escape from Ephrafa less than a year before, does jar a little for me. So, overall, canon, but with misgivings.
Next time, the leadership of Watership Down have problems closer to home. Thank mm-hmm. you.